Okay, uh, I think we are live and I want to thank everybody who's tuning in right now uh, and welcome you all to this, uh, which is the first of four digital teachings for Verso Books and the Relational Poverty Network, uh, entitled Thinking and Organising Beyond the Pandemic. Uh, so if you're tuning in via Verso, uh, Verso's Facebook page or YouTube feed, uh, you already know Verso Books and the our co-sponsor, the Relational Poverty Network, is an international network of scholars and activists uh, who believe that poverty is not just an object to be studied uh, or a problem to be solved, but uh, uh, a, a, a multi-dimensional uh, uh, combination of vulnerabilities, disenfranchisements, disempowerments, layered upon layered, produced, produced by uh, interlocking systems from capitalism to uh, patriarchy to colonialism uh, that co-produce vulnerabilities and privileges, power and disempowerment. So uh, in that spirit, we're trying to look at the effects of the pandemic uh, across a range of different systems uh, and interlocking forms of co-produced privilege and vulnerability. Uh, so the Relational Poverty Network has a commitment to engaged theory, theory that is uh, engaged with activists and advocates uh, and brings us into dialogue. And for that reason, uh, these teachings are aim aiming to bring uh, scholars and activists uh, together uh, in one space and to do it globally because of course the, the pandemic is a global phenomenon. Um, the pandemic pulls at every thread uh, of our social fabric at once. And so we can figure out how to respond to it in all of those different dimensions. Uh, the pandemic is also a crisis within a crisis and actually a crisis within, uh, within many, many crises. So these four teachings will look at four dimensions of that, uh, of that crisis. Shelter, care and social reproduction, uh, borders, uh, and the economy or the safety net. Um, and so this is the, this, the first one, we'll look at shelter and the relationship between shelter and the city. Um, in that sense, we were already in the midst of a global housing crisis before this began. There are roughly 1 billion people around the world who are in some sense homeless, uh, meaning they don't have legal, permanent or secure access uh, to shelter, whether they're squatting or living in uh, favelas or, or sleeping rough on the street. Uh, that's one out of every seven human beings around the world uh, is by some definition homeless. So that's the crisis we found ourselves in before the pandemic began. Uh, and then of course, many, and many, many, many of our cities are increasingly unequal. Uh, we face what uh, Richard Florida calls a new urban crisis of segregation and polarization uh, in many of our cities where the uber rich uh, and foreign finance capital build condominiums just as a form of investment uh, and so we have housing as a commodity while people don't have access to it in cities all around the world so today uh, we're bringing together activists from uh, five different cities buenos aires melbourne honolulu Seattle and San Francisco uh, and in all of those places uh, while there are very different realities on the ground there are also parallels these are all places where we are experiencing uh, massive growth or until now we were experiencing massive growth in some ways in the housing market uh, high luxury real estate sits empty while the number of people uh, facing housing scarcity also grows uh, uh, and those people all face in various ways forms of criminalization or, or disenfranchisement. And then on top of that, we have a pandemic. So today we'll have activists from all five of those cities talk about their experience uh, and the ways in which the pandemic is exacerbating that. And also the opportunities that the pandemic is opening up where we, f we find that we can now mobilize to, uh, to find hotel rooms for people who are homeless. Uh, or people get together to um, 
sorry, I'm also getting <laughs> getting chats from people who are watching this, uh, where people can get together uh, uh, in solidarity in a brand new way. So how this will work is we'll have three blocks of speakers, uh, one block per country. The first block from the United States, uh, the second block from Buenos Aires, or Buenos Aires and Argentina, and the third block from Australia. And we'll have uh, speakers from each place. So I'll introduce each block, uh, and then you'll hear a, a learning talk from each speaker, and then they'll have a chance to respond to each other. If you're listening via YouTube or Facebook Live or Crowdcast, uh, you can participate by throwing your questions into the chat, and then at the end of the uh, at the end of our time. Uh, we'll be able to respond to those as well. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks again for being with us. And our first block uh, will be uh, activists and scholars from the United States. So we'll hear from Sarah Rankin, who is the uh, founder of the Homeless Rights Advocacy Project and a professor of law at Seattle University. We'll hear from Christopher Herring, who's a sociologist, uh, soon to be at Harvard University and also an organizer in San Francisco. And we'll hear from Tina Grandinetti, who is uh, a geographer, a member of the Unequal Cities uh, Network, and also an organizer in the Honolulu Tenants Union. Uh, so we'll hear from Sarah first. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass it on to Sarah. Thank you so much. Can you hear me OK? And coming through. Wonderful. Uh, thanks to everybody for being here. I'm so excited to learn from from all of you, uh, and thanks for inviting me to to share some really quick thoughts uh, about what the pandemic means in terms of criminalization. And so, uh, when I speak about criminalization here in in Seattle, and the way we think about it from the Homeless Rights Advocacy Project perspective, we're really talking about laws that punish people. Uh, unhoused people for surviving in public space. Um, and that's even when unsheltered people lack a reasonable alternative. So there's a lot of work um, that's been done uh, by a lot of folks, um, including our group, but a, a lot of other folks across the country and across the globe that document how damaging this process is of criminalizing people and processing vulnerable people through the criminal justice system. Um, before the pandemic, before the onset of COVID, here in the United States, we had a, a very interesting circumstance, um, especially in a jurisdiction along the West Coast where we have the most pronounced unsheltered homeless populations in our country. Uh, a decision called Martin v. Boise was rendered. And this decision extended our Eighth Amendment uh, constitutional prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment um, to cities that were prosecuting unsheltered people for sleeping or camping in public space. Um, this ruling uh, was highly contentional. Uh, it was very contentious. People, uh, things were very polarized. Um, but it did give a lot of folks some hope that that decision, Martin v. Boise, might actually push cities to stop criminalizing homelessness and instead address its underlying causes. Um, but uh, again, even before this pandemic, there were a number of us, um, myself among them, who really started to worry that rather than facilitating solutions, what Martin was actually starting to do was to push cities to evolve uh, in the ways that they were criminalizing. So they were finding new ways to hide uh, and confine unsheltered people. Um, I have referred to this process as transcarceration. Uh, it's a phrase that's used in a lot of social control theories, but it basically means you're moving from openly punitive campaigns to incarcerate unsheltered people to these campaigns that seem so nice and gentle uh, that still confine unsheltered people through means like um, involuntary commitment into psychiatric facilities. Or, or compulsory uh, segregation into authorized zones or camps that have a lot of comparisons, very valid comparisons to migrant camps or internment camps. Um, so these transcarceratory movements have really been exacerbated in light of, of COVID. What we're seeing is a lot of cities resorting to converting convention centers and other mass camp areas into 
what are functionally enormous detention facilities um, where they impose very strict rules that, that essentially confine people uh, there. And so a number of activists and advocates in the United States, myself included, started comparing notes and, and were sharing notes about how we thought we could be pushing back. Um, my colleague, Chris, will be talking a lot about his amazing work at the street level. What I've been concentrating on is working with um, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and our regional ACLU to support impact litigation and direct litigation to stop cities in engaging in aggressive sweeps of unhoused people. So that's another trend we're seeing is very aggressive, no notice, completely comprehensive sweeps of unhoused people in the name of public health and safety. Um, the problem with these sorts of sweeps, aside from the fact that they're expensive and have been shown to make homelessness worse, is the fact that those sweeps are conducted in contravention of um, our Centers for Disease Control guidance, um, which is our federal um, agency that um, has issued guidance that says you shouldn't be putting people into congregate spaces where the disease can spread so easily. And instead, you should be prioritizing individualized units that will allow people to self-isolate and weather the, uh, the pandemic. So we are busy testing legal challenges under Martin v. Boise, um, arguing that these sorts of uh, transcarceratory efforts uh, amount to cruel and unusual punishment um, for people who need to survive in public space when there's no individualized units available. Um, really pushing back on efforts to put people into these massive congregate shelters. We're exploring some other theories. Um, here in the United States, uh, we would refer to it as state-created danger. So we're looking at state-created danger theories, um, other constitutional theories that basically challenge uh, what the whether the state is creating danger, new danger for people when they're held under custodial settings under the force of law, like we're seeing here in the United States. We have um, Americans with Disabil Disabilities Act. That's a statute here in the United States um, that focuses on um, equity uh, in terms of how the laws apply to people with disabilities. Uh, and then our Homeless Rights Advocacy Project issued um, a call to action uh, for our policymakers to uh, basically what we did was demand that state and local governments immediately ensure that people experiencing homelessness are protected during the COVID outbreak. Um, and I won't go into detail because my time is short, but you can find that online. The call to action basically uh, had five points, uh, arguing that policymakers have to take immediate action to one, uh, stop harmful actions like criminalization and to offer basic support to unsheltered people. Two, had to uh, build, immediately build and aggressively build sy uh, systemic capacity for more successful outreach. Um, three, to stop using congregate shelters uh, to um, address the, the pandemic and instead to, um, four, dramatically increase temporary individual housing units. And like many other countries, we're looking at um, the uh, seizure of hotels and motels for that purpose. And then five, uh, the final recommendation was uh, for policymakers to aggressively scale up our supportive housing capacity. So individual units that um, uh, provide people with voluntary services and treatment, not forced services and treatment, but the services and treatment are available if people should want them. So that's the five um, major recommendations that, that we made. So I'll pause there. Um, I know I've got limited time, but I'll pause there and, and turn it back to, uh, to David. Um, Sarah, thank you very much. That's fantastic. And you had 40 seconds left if you wanted to play with it. <laughs> Um, and it's really, really helpful. And I think that will link in really well also with what uh, Chris Herring is about to say. And Chris Herring, again, is a sociologist from uh, or about from Harvard University, uh, but is currently working in San Francisco on parallel issues there. So, Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, David, for organizing this. I'm going to try to share my screen to get some images up of the presentation I want to be giving today. If it doesn't work, I'll go back to the video, but let's try this out here. Uh, so I'm going to choose desktop two. 
share. All right. Okay. My notes are, and I'm going to switch it up so I go to the other viewfinder. Let me do this really quickly. There, okay. I go here. Ah. Okay. Does this look right? Do you see my my slide now? Uh, we can see your notes as well. <laughs> you still see the notes. Okay. Let me go back. You see my slide? Uh, slide and notes. Ah, uh, it didn't uh, work. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go out of this then. It did oh, work. Working it's working now, Chris. It just it's, was yeah. delayed. Is it working now? Yes. yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. So um, to begin, uh, yeah, today I, I'm, in, I'm at UC Berkeley right now, heading soon to Harvard. What I'll be drawing on today, though, is from my research governing homelessness in the city in 2014, but also my ongoing organizing work, especially of late here, uh, as a, working daily as a core member of the San Francisco Coalition on Homelessness. And that's what I'll mainly be speaking on today. Uh, so I'm going to first discuss this intersecting crisis of homelessness and COVID-19, then discuss the current progressive possibilities underway, and then some of the neoliberal nightmares that I'm seeing on the horizon that uh, Sarah just alluded to and some ideas of what's coming next. So, you know, in general, disasters and crises lay bare these class inequalities, and we see this mainly because the negative impacts of these disasters are disproportionately borne by those on the lower rungs of the class ladder. Um, COVID-19, of course, is no different, but I think housing precarity does contribute to the social suffering and ultimately social murder, as Engels would have called it, in ways unique to pandemics versus other sorts of crises. And uh, first are the unique dangers of viral spread faced by the unhoused. So without a vaccine or medical treatment, all of our preventative measures, physical distancing, reducing social contacts, and increased sanitation rely on the infrastructures of home. So you can't get to shelter in place. And rather than the state providing you with the economic means to allow you to protect your health, they simply exempt you of these laws as we see in the public health order here issued in San Francisco and other cities across the country. So you're left in the shelter or on the street. And the shelter in these settings, it's impossible to physically distance. You have shared bathrooms and poor ventilation. It makes these like a Petri dish for viral spread. This is a photo I took during my field work where I spent over 90 nights in these shelters. This shelter in particular uh, had an outbreak. 105 residents and staff were infected and similar outbreaks have occurred across the country. Four of the five shelters on LA Skid Row have been closed after breakouts. In New York City, 900 shelter residents have tested positive, 75 have died, and 145 shelters have had infections. The list goes on. Sarah can talk about Seattle, similar outbreaks going on there as well. Now on the street, although you may guard against the viral spread um, you know, through the protection of the tents and more distancing, you have little access to toilets and hand washing. Um, symptoms likely go unchecked and many unhoused folks avoid hospitalization because of the criminalization that Sarah just spoke about with the destruction of property. So there's big incentives to just ride out the virus. So organizers and policy officials have responded to these dilemmas in San Francisco. And uh, to my surprise, actually, I have to say, unlike my experience organizing in New Orleans after Katrina, there have been a number of progressive moves that have taken place. And so I just want to briefly uh, go over some of these uh, that we've seen so far. So first is there has been massive decriminalization in San Francisco per the CDC, uh, which is our um, Center for Disease Control Guidelines. Um, San Francisco, even though it's very liberal and looks like a nice place for homeless folks, actually is very mean to homeless folks. 40, 24 anti-homeless laws are on the books. We had 52 police officers who worked full time addressing over 8,000 911 homeless complaints every single month before the pandemic. The coalition had fought this for years to slow it down. And since March 23rd, the police have stopped responding to these complaints. They've stopped confiscating tents and they have stopped issuing citations. And our jails have actually let more people out than they have taken in. Ironically, though, many are going onto the streets. So we had to do a lot of initial organizing around this in March, but once the CDC said, 
very clearly, cities should not take tents or move encampments because it could increase viral uh, spread. The city has stopped. And in the ceasefire, we have been able to uh, distribute tents. We have distributed with the coalition over 1,000 tents to those on the streets. And we've tried this many times before, but they've always been quashed and met with retaliation. So right now, this has been a real opening for some projects of mutual aid. The other opening has been uh, opening of organized encampments. Um, so we've long, again, pushed for this as the harm reduction strategy in San Francisco, never got it off the ground. But now the city has tolerated a community-led camp in the African-American community pictured here in the Bayview neighborhood that was established through a park occupation. And now the city has started setting up its own sanctioned encampments and we have legislation pending uh, to open up more. Now, San Francisco, we did not open up convention centers. We were about to, it's a photo of the one we were about to open, uh, but we have instead uh, closed the shelters and we have really pushed strong on hotels. And now, um, you know, with the death of tourism and the industry begging for bailouts, um, we have 30,000 vacant rooms typically used to serve corporate profits and outside tourists and now being used to protect its most vulnerable during the pandemic. Now, Initially, the city was just going to use hotel rooms for those who were recovering from COVID-19 as quarantine spaces, but a group of progressive legislators passed legislation to acquire 7,000 hotel rooms to shelter nearly all the city's homeless during the pandemic. Now, the mayor has been reluctant to uh, go forward with this. Uh, we've only got 2,000 rooms so far, far. I'm happy to talk about these challenges. But we have now been pushing with direct actions like you see here, a group of doctors who have uh, helped protect a group of poor folks occupying a hotel, car caravans outside of the mayor's press conferences, projections on city halls, and it's really brought together a lot of um, progressive organizations. Now, um, I'm worried that this is a bit of a pause, that this is a state of exception, and I'm really worried what's going to happen with the reopenings. Um, I'm worried it might be a situation, it's like a revanchist, the bourgeois comes back to town and needs to reclaim the city and starts moving towards exactly the sorts of policies Sarah talked about. And we see criminalization with a vengeance, plus the viral surveillance that we're going to see with things like contact tracing. Um, and already we're hearing the use of police using drones looking you know, out for camps. When do we turn the you know, drones that are telling people to socially distance to now using towards, you know, putting people back in jail. We're also seeing the worry of institutionalization and securitization of the camps and also hotels, uh, which have a lot of uh, security in the hotels. And um, there's worry that the sheriffs are standing outside and guarding these areas. And then finally, just this unprecedented wave of mass homelessness we may be facing. Um, a report came out of Columbia University yesterday predicting a 40% increase of homelessness by this summer if we don't figure out how to cancel the rent and keep people in their homes. So right now in the U.S. we have about 500,000 folks homeless. That would be 800,000 by August alone. Um, I think I'm running out of time or I'm out of time with all of my technical difficulties, but I'm happy to talk about what I see as how we move from, uh, you know, these temporary measures to building more structural long-term um, uh, gains on this. So thank you very much. I'll stop my screen sharing and move on to the next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, and thanks for, thanks for bringing slides. Um, our next speaker is Tina Grandinetti, who again is uh, a geographer uh, affiliated with the Unequal Cities Network and a co-organizer in the Honolulu Tenants Union. Uh, Tina, I'll pass it over to you. Cool. Um, thank you so much. I am really grateful to be part of this discussion, especially because it's actually pretty rare for Hawaii to be included in these kinds of international conversations. So thank you very much to the organizers. Um, I do think most people know very little about life here beyond a certain image of paradise. So I'm going to give a little bit of a broader view of the politics of dispossession in Hawaii. Um, we're really not just the pristine beaches you think of. Hawaii is densely urbanized and um, like the other cities we'll talk about today, before COVID-19, we were already in the midst of a severe housing crisis. Um, almost 60% of renters were housing cost burdened. One third of households spent half of their income on shelter alone. Um, and then policymakers and developers telling us we can build our way out of this crisis, despite the fact that 
a quarter of home purchases in 2018 were made by out-of-state buyers, um, with that number reaching over 40% on Maui and Hawaii Island. Um, and meanwhile, the state has the second highest per capita rate of houselessness in the nation with Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiians disproportionately represented. So as a settler born and raised in Hawaii, but not indigenous to this place, I wanted to bring with me the words of a friend of mine, John Ka'ulupali. He's a Kanaka Maoli living on the streets of Honolulu for about the last decade or so. And he refers to himself like a lot of others as houseless rather than homeless. And when I asked him one day why he told me something I'll never forget, he said, I will never be homeless in Hawaii. Hawaii is the place of my ancestors. I have family here. I have culture here. I have the aina. And in Hawaiian language, aina means land. And that translate to, translates to that which feeds or that which nourishes. And it entails a genealogical familial relationship with Kanaka, Maoli, um, that endures even in the face of displacement and dispossession. So I bring Uncle John's words because I think it's important to remember that in Hawaii, when we are talking about the meaning of shelter, um, we're always dealing with these deeper questions of what home and land mean. Um, home and land as property and assets or home and land as aina, as that which nourishes us. Um, and we can see this too in the emergence of Kanaka-led uh, encampments uh, as pu'uhonua um, or places of refuge. So to me, um, taking the pre-COVID-19 housing crisis, even as the starting point to this story, is missing this deeper conflict and these deeper structures of oppression um, that are shaping what the pandemic looks like here. Um, so without going too much into this history, the independent kingdom of Hawaii was illegally overthrown by American sugar barons in 1893 and then unilaterally annexed by the U.S. in violation of international law in 1898. And since then, Kanaka have collectively fought against a prolonged occupation that has enabled um, the ongoing settlement of Hawaiian lands. And then meanwhile, the government shaped Hawaii's entire economy around two industries, tourism, which last year brought 10 million visitors to our island home of 1.4 million people. So just let that number sink in for a second. And then the military, which currently controls roughly a quarter of the land of on Oahu, the island that I live on. Again, just like let that sink in because our entire urban landscape has been shaped by the needs of these two industries. Um, and then in the last decade, speculative development has also joined that list. Um, so now COVID is forcing us to reckon with the fact that our major economic drivers are really predatory and they're making us more vulnerable to the crisis. Um, we import 80 to 90% of our food here. And if the ships stop coming, we have about two weeks of food for our community. Um, and because of our dependence on tourism, we're at nearly 40% unemployment right now. We went from one of the lowest rates of unemployment in the nation, I think at 3%, to now 40%. Um, and at the moment, there are very few protections for the 41% of households that rent. Uh, we do have an emergency um, proclamation that includes a moratorium on evictions, but it's much weaker than some of the ones we're seeing in California um, and New York and Seattle. There are no protections for renters in the days after the proclamation ends, no provisions about the back payment of rent, and no protections against late, uh, protections against late penalties. And then for the unsheltered, um, sweeps are continuing. They stopped for about two weeks after the CDC guidelines came out and there was a lot of public um, pushback, but then they continued again. And it, there's a really disturbing racial dynamic there too. Um, our, in Honolulu, our mayor, Kurt Caldwell, a white man is criminalizing the unsheltered, many people of color, many Kanaka who are houseless in their own homeland. And it's really kind of felt pretty vindictive. Like in the in the days, um, in the early days of the shutdown, they even shut down all public restrooms and told the houseless that they would have to find other facilities. So eventually, houseless advocates had to step up um, to enlist or to get the bathrooms reopened, um, and then the city and state refused to stock them with hygienic supplies. So. Houses advocates had to create and fund their own program to enlist volunteers from the houses community to clean and sterilize publicly owned bathrooms. Um, meanwhile, 
there in the New York Times this week, they ran an article about people trapped in scenic limbo during the pandemic and interviewed a woman from the Bay Area who was waiting out the pandemic with her family um, in, quote, an empty house her mother keeps in Honolulu. Um, very luxurious. And she was worried that she had robbed her kids of the experience of understanding what the world is going through because they're, they felt like they're on extended vacation. Um, and I bring this up because I don't think we can talk about the, the politics of housing and shelter in Hawaii without talking about this sense of settler entitlement to Hawaii's lands and waters. Um, white, Amer white wealthy Americans can wait out the pandemic on extended vacation. Um, in Hawaii County, um, people are up in arms over a proposal, or the wealthy are up in arms over a proposal to raise taxes on luxury second homes. And then meanwhile, we have um, settlers of color, Kanaka, crammed into multi-generational households. We have the highest in the nation. Houses Kanaka being swept from the sidewalks while um, there are literally thousands of hotel rooms sitting empty and no real serious discussion about um, opening those up to the houseless. Um, and so walking through Waikiki right now, our hotel district, it's really confronting, but also kind of mind opening to see how much urban space we've handed over to tourist consumption and to maybe imagine alternatives to that. Um, so the, I guess the point is that none of this is new, but there is, a, I think, a new sense of urgency. So um, I am part of the organizing committee for a very newly formed Honolulu Tenants Union which really kicked into gear because of the anticipation of a wave of COVID evictions. Um, and our Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women put out a feminist recovery plan. Um, but what gives me the most cautious optimism is that this pandemic hit Hawaii as we were experiencing a wave of Kanaka movements to protect Aina from corporate de development and desecration. So we were already in the midst of a really transformative shift um, and on an island with limited land and resources, I think that's really what we need because there's no way we can um, escape the precarity that produces housing insecurity without confronting occupation and settler colonialism and transforming our relationship to Aina um, through indigenous knowledge and sovereignties and practices that grow out of the land itself. Tina, thank you so much. Uh, and Sarah, Christopher, Tina, thank you all uh, enormously. I've, uh, I'm already, uh, my head is already uh, um, a lot richer <laughs> for having this all of you. Um, what, what we're going to do again is uh, we'll have three blocks of speakers, one from each, uh, uh, each national territory, although as we've just heard, national territory is a, a part of the problem. But so I'll ask you, uh, within each block, then I'll give, give everybody a chance to respond uh, conversationally to one another. So I'll give Sarah, Christopher and Tina each a, a chance to respond to one another again. So Sarah, are you there? Yes, hi. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Great. Um, you know, one of the things that really, um, that I struggle with when I listen to um, and when I'm educated by Tina and when I hear from Christopher is trying to figure out how we can do a better job uh, organizing across jurisdictions. So I'm, I'm learning so much from what Tina is saying. Um, I've, I've, um, I'm already hugely in debt to Christopher for things that he's taught me. I know we're going to be learning more from our other um, speakers. I'm wondering, you know, I don't know if this is something that the Relational Poverty Network does, but it, it seems to me that part of the problem uh, is that we're so fractured, right, in the way that we approach these things. And we need to come up with a better way for us to be able to educate each other, maybe share databases of information and, um, you know, litigation, for example, organizing strategies. Um, so I just sort of am throwing that out there. I'd love to hear, you know, if Tina and Chris have thought about this before, or David, if you have um, suggestions. I, yeah, I think a lot about this, especially on the issue of um, homelessness specifically, because I think a lot of it has to do with the way in which during the Reagan era, housing and homelessness has become um, 
Um, so in San Francisco, um, every, when we have our elections, we ask voters, what's the number one issue? Consistently, it's homelessness, even above affordable housing, which is now second. Time and time again, when you ask on the federal elections, homelessness doesn't even register. And um, I think that um, it's very difficult organizing even regionally, it, like within the Bay Area and then within the state and, and federal. So um, I think one, one thing that's kind of hopeful, but still problematic is that there has been more of a push at the state level around homelessness and housing uh, with this recent round, at least in California. But it really points to me of the need of looking to the federal ideas and some that were being kicked around by some of the Democratic nominees this time, where we heard for the first time, you know, serious focus on housing and homelessness, because it's in these situations, at least at the government level, that we need this. Um, but I hear you, Sarah, on the organizing. Uh, there's great need, especially in this moment of policy experimentation and organizing, to be sharing these tactics. Um, thanks, Chris. And Tina, do you um, do you have uh, a minute or two to uh, to respond? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I was really thinking um, along those same lines. Hearing, I, first of all, I only learned the word transcarceration just now, um, and it's so helpful for thinking about the kinds of tactics we're seeing um, from our government. Also, interestingly, the ways that it's appropriating. Um, indigenous um, terms, like uh, when we talk about zones, um, now our, um, we're hearing a lot about Kalhale zone, and Kalhale is the word for a village. So um, kind of like taking these indigenous concepts and practices um, to maybe dress up um, transcarceral policies. Um, and also, I'm just a little bit envious of the kinds of organizing that Chris was sharing. Um, we have so many hotels. Like I said, we have an entire district that's sitting empty right now. It's kind of eerie um, and no real serious talk about um, housing people in those rooms. Um, and I would love to learn more about how we could make that happen. Um, but there have been some positive things like our hotel worker union, Unite Here Local 5, um, actually had, you know, laid off workers volunteering to staff one of the temporary um, individual um, housing shelters. So there is a lot of potential for that kind of work, um, but I think a little bit of uncertainty about how to get it done. Yeah, I just I just want to offer really quickly. Um, I've learned a lot about those strategies, Tina, from Chris, um, and and California has really been innovating in that particular space of of trying to secure um, hotel units. Um, you know, especially through this pandemic. But what we're finding is a number of those hotels and motels are struggling so uh, dramatically that they're offering to sell their their properties. Um, at a discounted rate to the city or the county or whatever the purchasing entity is. Um, and then the thinking that Chris and I have been pushing for is to try and see if we can make sure that those units are converted into affordable housing or supportive housing, right? And and not just turned into whatever else it might be. So I think um, it'd be really great. I, I just, I recommend connecting with Chris um, around those things, but it's, it's it, there's been a lot of work um, on on those sorts of, uh, points of experimentation um, that, that I'm sure he could share with you. Um, and I similarly, I, I just wanted to say one more thing um, that I learned from Tina and what really appreciated in some of her remarks is, but I think part of the challenge in organizing is the need to have people with lived experience <clears throat> participating in the organizing um, and how difficult that's to do, that is to do when people with lived experience, you know, are struggling every day to just sort of survive through the course of the day. Um, and so, you know, one of, that's a huge challenge that we have because we can't do anything uh, without it being guided by the perspectives and experience of people with lived experience and, and 
you know, the transient nature of homelessness and the the degree to which their days are consumed by just basically trying to get through the day make that difficult. And so I, I would love to hear anybody, you know, sort of comment about ideas for helping to better incorporate lived experience into the organizing. And that's, I know that's something that we're going to get, uh, get to hear from uh, Spike about yeah. um, when we get around to talking about Australia too. Yeah. It's, and that's a really important point. I think we, I mean, I, I think in Australia, in Victoria, our service, health services and homeless services talk a lot about um, yeah, yeah. including uh, people with a lived experience into um, decision-making processes and it just isn't happening. And when it does, it's tokenistic and people aren't supported. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'll probably talk, it's probably better to talk about that later. Yep, yep, so we'll come back to that. Yeah. I will just um, say, what, it's very difficult. The Coalition on Homelessness and works with the Western Regional Advocacy Project with Sarah works with, and we try to center that in our advocacy. It is admittedly very, very difficult right now with what's going on with the pandemic. That being said, Part of our hope is that even if the hotels, although we hope to get some of them, we know it won't last, it's still a better position to hopefully organize in. And same with these organized encampments when people aren't being chased around on the streets. So, I mean, I, I, there is also some hope that when people are in safe, <laughs> consolidated places and have that care, that that can be a point to, to build or organization from. So right now it's still very difficult though. Uh, all right, on that note, uh, I think, uh, and I'm also uh, grateful to uh, uh, Monica Ferias and Jorgelina Diorio uh, because it is quite late there in Buenos Aires. Um, so, uh, Monica is a geographer uh, with CONICET, which is a national research or, uh, organization, and also La Universidad de Buenos Aires. Um, and Jorgelina is uh, also a psychologist. <laughs> With Connie Set and University of the Buenos Aires, and they both organised with La Asamblea uh, Plaza San Diego uh, or Plaza Dorigo San Delmo, which is uh, a grassroots uh, grassroots group that works on a range of issues, including homelessness. There. Um, so, without any further ado, I'll pass on to uh, to Monica first. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you so much for organising this. I think this is a really critical time to be thinking about the way we live, the way that we relate to each other, the way we work and the way we might envision new ways of organizing. So uh, I appreciate so much the opportunity uh, to be together in conversation. So first I'd like to provide a little bit of context to my brief presentation and that of Corgilinas to help the audience better um, picture the situation in Buenos Aires. So on the one hand, Argentina didn't get really caught up in this health versus the economy confrontation. That's been a lot in the discussions about the pandemic. As early as, as, early as March 12th, the national government declared the state of uh, sanitary emergence. And in March 19th, the whole country went into preventive and mandatory social isolation. So um, that is that non-essential activities were suspended, including schools and churches and medical appointments. Um, although this measure has been loosened up a little bit lately, we are still till the day in um, preventive and mandatory isolate, isolation. So also the government uh, quickly organized with local authorities um, and, and moved to strengthen the state of the universal public uh, health system, um, coordinated with the private and semi-private sectors to uh, secure the availability of resources and the equal access to them as long as emergency stay in place. So, that's very important to keep in mind. And lastly, the national government immediately implemented what is called the family emergency income to assist those in most need. On the other hand, Buenos Aires, just like uh, many cities in Latin America, experiences a really high level of housing precarity. So over um, 250,000 people uh, in a population of nearly 3 million in the city of Buenos Aires lived in some of one of the 40 precarious settlements or, or slums. Um, in relation to the homeless popul population, we need to make a distinction between those who sleep rough 
and the hidden homeless population. So according to the popular census of homeless people, the second one conducted last year by a group of social political organizations, um, there are 5,412 people sleeping rough and close to 2,000 people uh, sleeping in shelters every day. And in relation to the hidden homeless population, that is people who live in rooming houses, sometimes with uh, state support, who struggle a lot to pay the rent, the number is really uh, astonishing, gigantic. So it's over 25,000 people at the risk of becoming homeless, um, sleeping, sleeping right homeless at any minute. So the social isolation significantly delayed the spread of the virus and for weeks the rate of infection was quite low and mostly focused on wealthy neighborhoods, right? Because of um, what we call the imported uh, cases. But we knew that when the community transmission phase of the virus started, it'll be the homeless and people living in slums, the ones most affected, because as we all know, uh, to be able to quarantine or shelter in place is a privilege based on class and race. And both homeless and people in slums can simply say, um, stay at home, either because there isn't a home or because the material conditions in that home are not appropriate to uh, sustain life. So the local government's response regarding specifically, specifically homeless people has been to make available a few extra shelters that are only open during winter time. And, and they invited people <laughs> sleeping rough to go to these shelters. In relation to these, there's been a lot of pushback from many organizations, including our organization, um, and, and from politicians and right advocacy groups. Because first of all, the numbers of it, it's not enough. Uh, it's really complicated to get access to these places, even if there are beds available. Also, uh, there's not appropriate attention for people with mental health issues or with problematic substance use. And ultimately, these are not safe places anyway. In fact, in the last few days, the virus started to spread in shelters for homeless people at an unprecedented rate in the city. Uh, for instance, the shelter nearby the Asamblea, the, where we work, had to close because 79 people out of 92 were diagnosed with COVID last Tuesday. So that's, that's a huge number, right? So what well, the pandemic reveals in Buenos Aires is at least two things for us. One is the persistent invisibilization of homeless people. So except for the opening of new shelters, which is not even a permanent solution, there are no other specific measures aimed to this population. The overall approach to the COVID crisis has been thought for certain kinds of housed people. Also, the paperwork for the family emergency income is complicated, especially since everything it has to be to do uh, it has to be done online, and we we know how hard it is, at least in Buenos Aires, for homeless people to get access to internet. And when they do, it's so complicated to navigate the the ropes of the of the complicated online bureaucracy. And importantly, the requirements for uh, of these programs show that the people who came up with the policy do not know well the people to which that policy uh, is aimed. Because for instance, people do not qualify for assistance if they are also the recipients of the equivalent of food stamps and other sort of welfare programs, which basically rules out half the homeless population in the city. And all of this, as I said, made quite evident that the invisibilization of homeless people continues to be a key feature of urban governance in Buenos Aires. The pandemic also reveals that the housing crisis is the crisis. So after 13 years of an administration that has made huge profits selling public land, rezoning certain areas of the city, and this investing in social housing programs, the living conditions of thousands of people has aggravated, not to mention the sharp increase in the homeless population in the last few years. And uh, I mentioned there are over 250,000 people living in slums and precarious settlements. Of the 7,000 infected people in Argentina since March 7th, which is not March, March 4th, sorry, uh, 972 live in slums. And in fact, in the last 24 hours, there were um, 255 new cases in the whole country, out of which 81 live in precarious neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. 
And we've also seen an increase in the number of homeless people sleeping rough because the whole informal economy came to a halt with the mandatory isolation. Uh, so people haven't been able to complete the complement, sorry, the state um, support for um, to pay a room right, in a rooming house, which speaks uh, of the extreme precarity of thousands and, and thousands of people at risk of becoming homeless, um, sleeping rough at any minute. So what's, what's next? And uh, I'll just end with this. Um, well, what we think uh, it's next uh, is to really stand behind all the organizing that has been happening on the right to housing that first contemplates the possibility of cooperative housing and collective housing. And second, that envisions alternatives to housing regulated other, are, other than the ones uh, regulated by the market. So like the ones that treat housing as a commodity and start seeing the house as, as a right to everyone um, uh, that goes beyond the, the, the mere building of the house and, and, and contemplates all the other things that people need to, to, to thrive in life. That's Monica, that's, that's uh, my timer has just gone off, so you're, you're right on time. Um, and that's that's really helpful. Uh, and I'll hand it off to Jorge Lina, uh, who again uh, works in many of the same areas. I don't know if I can do it so well as Monica. I will try. Uh, also, I, I don't know if I could speak so good English as she. So forget if I have any mistake. I will do all my effort. But one of the things we discussed a lot with Monica, and the, I think. This is a, um, an opportunity for us to discuss in the same session because we are uh, studying and also organizing things with homeless people in the same organization. So it was an opportunity for us to think, to stop and think about some things, uh, not only the action, because both of us are uh, uh, taking some outward work with homeless people and shelter homeless people right now. So this is a good opportunity to stop and think a little. So one of the things I, I want to, to highlight is that this uh, thing that the, the COVID pandemic highlights, it's not, not only a housing aspect, a housing issue, that also house, uh, homelessness is a health public uh, problem. And we think that the pandemic highlights this um, Monica explained very well the housing crisis in Buenos Aires and is similar in different cities, not only Latin America, in the world. But we think that from the public health perspective, the relationship between homelessness and health is strong and multifaceted. Um, the adverse health links encodes a wide variety of outcomes including mental and physical issues, uh, some infectious diseases, chronic diseases, uh, reproductive conditions, and many other negative health outcomes. Moreover, housing insecurity is a pattern along the line of social inequality and is related with health disparities that are historically root. And we think that this is uh, very important to highlight because uh, we are thinking in a more, um, integrate way to think in the health. Health is not only the access to the attention, it's um, things related with job insecurities, with housing insecurity, with something that we call dignity denial. That means those aspects that affect the people, stigmatized groups like homelessness, related with criminalization, stigma, violence. So those are aspects that impacts in health the, in in, uh, in this public health perspective and we we want to highlight also that many homeless people in Buenos Aires city refuse going to the shelters and we we want to hide, to point out this because we think that this is a way of resistance and to express their um, refuse their, um, uh, I don't know how to say, sorry, my, my English, but they, they're trying to express that they, they don't agree with some public policies and this specifically related with the shelters. And this is something that homeless people is telling, is denouncing, reporting, not from now, from many years. And also community-based organization and political organization like ours and also 
some scholars are um, reporting this from many years. So it's not new that shelters or mass shelters don't work to as a response for addressing homelessness. So we need to think in other ways to shelter. But in this aspect, we think that when homeless people refuse, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, of the isolation measure that the government take, many of the social organizations, including ours, encourage homeless people to go to the shelters because we thought that it will be best for people to stay in places, trying to be um, in a place during this uh, pandemic. But immediately homeless people start to refuse going there because they said that they are not safer. And of course they, they are right because now we have some shelters that are closed because many people are COVID positive. So um, that means um, that homeless people can take care of themselves and many times social organizations don't take into account their perspective, the things, the ideas they have to how to take care of themselves, the idea of um, which, which, is, which is the first option, the, the best option of shelter for them and also for care. So we think it's important for us to include homeless people in uh, addressing the response. And that is something that the assembly uh, where we are part of uh, specifically do, do. And also a group of more than 20 social uh, community organization are trying to do how we include them in the solution because they are part of the problem but also they know how to build mm -hmm. new responses for this uh, not only for the pandemic we think also for the other things that the pandemic um, express or show so um one of the um, I, I think i don't know if i, I have time but our advocacy project i, I mean it's a call for action um, first of all, trying to stop using congregate, congregate, congregate shelters to respond to the pandemic, but also to pay to attention to these individual units. We think that we need to ask homeless people which is the, first, the best option of shelter or housing they want, and uh, not to think without them. No, we need to include them in the solution. Also to mon monitoring the conditions not only in the shelters, also in the places where people maybe need to be isolated because they maybe have uh, the virus, but they don't need a hospitalization. So we need to, we are calling for monitoring these shelters and the conditions. And specifically, according, uh, taking into account this, um, how, we, how we include homeless people in the solution, is to include or to think in harm reduction strategies and perspective. And that's meant not only for drug use, because in general, harm reduction perspective in the beginning is thinking on only for drug users. But in a Latin American perspective, we think in the harm reduction perspective as a way to reduce vulnerabilities. And this perspective is a change of the way in not only how we think in the problems, also how we build the solution with those who are affected from the problems. So we think that uh, this is uh, what, one of the things we need to change after the pandemic, because the pandemic only highlights the things that uh, many social organizations are reporting from many years from now. So the, the things are not news related with the housing, related with the less access to the health system. We need to change the way in, we, in which we think in the problems and how we include homeless, homeless people in the solution. Um, Aurelina, that's uh, really, really helpful uh, and right on time also. <laughs> um, I wonder, so you've both got a moment to respond to each other and since you work together, it's sort of quite, it's already quite a conversation. I wonder if you have, uh, do each have anything to add to one another? I just want to highlight something. 
Do you want to go first, Jorgelia? No, no, no. No, no. I was just thinking about, and, and I would like to highlight the, the that this, at least in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, is a really critical moment to uh, for social and political organizations to sort of find the cracks, you know, to to get to push for um, broader policy. So this, um, I think that the, with with the whole Kuwait crisis, the government has been, especially because at the national level we have a progressive government. Uh, no, it's, that's not the case in the city. So uh, it's and, and the government has been um, sort of open to have conversations and include social organizations in, in, in the solution. So this is, uh, we think it's a really key time to get together, organize and really push for more progressive policy. Um, yeah. No, and other one thing uh, that we also discuss a lot is that the struggle ahead is for universal rights, not for a specific policies. And mm -hmm. in this aspect, both of us are also feminists and a part of a feminist movement. So we think that the social movements needs to include this transversal perspective that the feminist movement have, have has for the way in which advocate for some problems. So uh, we, we think that uh, in this aspect of homelessness is too frag frag fraction and many social organizations are also uh, isolated and, and we need to include this feminist uh, theoretical frame to think in the, in the issue. You're, si you're silent, David. Sorry. Um, <laughs> what I can already see happening and what I'm really grateful for and what I was hoping for is, is a kind of global conversation already. And I'm seeing resonances across uh, all of these different cities already. So I just uh, keep in mind for when we have some time to chat at the end, uh, the kinds of questions you might want to ask one another. Um, and uh, we can move on to our third block, which is uh, based here in Melbourne. And so we've got uh, Libby Porter, uh, who is a geographer at the Royal Melbourne uh, Institute of Technology uh, and also a fellow organiser for the Save Public Housing uh, Collective here in Melbourne. Uh, and then I've got Spike from the Homeless Persons Union of Victoria here sitting next to me. It almost feels, uh, it almost feels wrong to have two people sitting next to each other on one screen, but here in Melbourne, we're now allowed to have up to five people in one place because um, we have uh, flattened the proverbial curve. <laughs> uh, uh, whatever that really means yeah. in practice. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, so we'll hear more about that in a moment. But so uh, we've got Spike you, and you, Libby. You, and you. Yeah, yeah. And so Libby, I'll, I'll give you eight minutes and then give Spike eight minutes. Thanks very much, um, David. It's so lovely to be with you all. Um, and thanks for having me as part of the conversation. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Tech is working, excellent, okay. Uh, so I, I wanna begin a, a little bit like um, Tina did, just to sketch a little bit of context um, from uh, here in Australia. Uh, and I guess to begin by noting that, of course, all dwelling um, for all of us, no matter in what forms we're dwelling here in Australia, um, happens on the unceded lands of sovereign peoples, um, of first peoples. Um, and so uh, and as a settler, as, a, as an uninvited guest um, here in uh, the country now called Australia, I want to acknowledge um, the peoples who've always been affected by dispossession and displacement, um, First Peoples of Australia, um, and particularly the country uh, where I live, um, where I am at the moment, which is the lands of the Wurundjeri people um, here in Melbourne, also known as Nam or Birurungar. Um, and so to think about country, which is the term uh, that uh, Aboriginal peoples use here in Australia to help, I think, white fellows understand what it means to dwell, the, 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 um, the life force that provides the fundamental security of dwelling, um, I think is tremendously important as part of this conversation. Um, perhaps a little bit resonant to what Tina was presenting as the Kanaka Māori uh, concept of aina, that which feeds or nourishes. Uh, and to note that first peoples are the first people 
um, to have experienced both the particular form of dwelling precarity um, that colonial capitalism induces, um, and of course, um, as some of the first peoples to have experienced the kind of terror that um, infectious disease, a pandemic, uh, brings um, to populations. And so I think it's important to kind of have that um, as part of the conversation too. Um, but I guess to sort of fan that out a little bit and to think about, um, I guess, a kind of colonial capitalist structure of how we produce shelter through this kind of extractive commodified mode that renders bodies vulnerable to crisis that renders bodies um, vulnerable to incarceration or transcarceration as well um, so that to think through uh, from my perspective anyway the, the kind of context of shelter and the pandemic um, in this particular moment as, um, as structurally linked to a very long story um, of, a, of, a, of a system of, of dwelling um, that is highly privatised, is rooted in private investment and developments, rooted in speculative and predatory practices, um, particularly here in Australia. So to give a little kind of context here, um, in Australia, the vast majority of housing form um, that we currently think of it in contemporary housing terms here in Australia is privately owned um, with a tiny percentage. Um, it's sort of variable regionally, but a tiny percentage, around four or five percent, is in what you might think of as non-market form, so public housing or social housing, other forms of kind of cooperative housing, although that's a really small percentage. Um, and the affordability context here in Australia has um, shrunk considerably and is causing uh, really extreme hardship for people. Um, according to some recent analyses I was reading um, here of the um, national rental list, just one or two properties one or two properties, which I just almost couldn't believe on that list would be affordable to a household on a moderately low income today. One or two properties across the whole of the country. So, um, so this sort of context of extreme housing stress um, and increasing housing stress, uh, it correlates with really massive wait lists for um, people uh, who are putting their hand up to say, I, I need help with housing. So massive wait lists for social housing. Here in Victoria, where I am, um, that's now at around 90 to 100,000 people in Victoria, the state of Victoria are on the, uh, the social housing wait list. Um, and there's a very large um, latent demand of people who are spending up to 80% of their income on rent um, and are therefore extremely vulnerable to you know, being immediately rendered um, sleeping rough and, and so forth. Um, so, so there's this kind of context of, in, of incredible housing stress, which is similar to many of the contexts that we've already been speaking about. Um, and I would say here as well, you know, the thing I'm kind of particularly interested in exploring a little more is the debate on uh, the public debate on affordability and homelessness and um, and housing crisis here. Uh, is incredibly shrill. It's dominated by the real estate sector. It's dominated by basically predatory interests in, in housing. Um, so that as soon as we start talking about, say, rental affordability uh, here in Australia, we immediately go to, you know, real estate agents to tell us about what that looks like. Um, and our debate is so perverted um, in this context. Uh, and I think that's a real issue that we have to deal with, that the voices that need to be heard on these matters just are not. Um, when property prices drop in Australia, basically there's widespread panic um, in parliaments around the country. Um, and, you know, rich people with multiple homes start worrying about whether they can survive the pandemic um, in their holiday home or, you know, they have to sort of stick it out in, in a metropolitan area. So, so the debate is really, really um, perverse um, and is, is a huge deflection um, from what is actually going on, which is, of course, the demonisation of people sleeping rough or experiencing homelessness, um, the demonisation of people who live in social housing um, and, uh, and a context of sustained disinvestment um, in the forms of non-market housing that would actually deal with um, the, the crisis that we have, or the multiple crises, intersecting crises that we're, we're dealing with. Um, so I think it's also useful to kind of look at the um, the policy context of um, of housing such that it is um, here in Australia, which, as I said, is incredibly privatised. Um, pretty much all housing in Australia is delivered through private investment and through private development. I think um, that links back to its sort of fundamental roots in commodification and extraction and the dispossession 
of land from um, Indigenous peoples and the reorganisation of that that country, that land, um, into forms of speculative wealth um, and, and the consequence of that for um, all sorts of people um, rendered uh, precarious in that kind of situation, that kind of structure um, of housing structure. Um, the other thing that we're dealing with here in Australia is um, a kind of retrenchment uh, or attraction by the state from um, uh, from public housing and other uh, forms of non-market housing. Uh, that's a, a sort of combination, sort of toxic mix, I would say, of sustained disinvestment. Um, so strategically not uh, walking away from um, actually doing like work in um, housing estates uh, and allowing them to just decay. Um, and then using that as a form of uh, justification for renewal. This is a widespread practice. We see it happen all over the place. Um, privatisation uh, and various forms of um, Kind of tricky uh, coordination of state and um, and and uh, private action um, to uh, render and, um, and re-coordinate um, systems of, of of wealth creation for those who can clearly afford it. Um, so um, I've just been given the one minute warning. So sorry, David, for um, rabbiting on. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on a, on a couple of key points, if I can, just to conclude. Um, having said all of that, I was um, thinking a lot recently about Ruth. Wilson Gilmore's you know really important contribution um, of helping us think about these systems as actually working that the housing system I think in Australia um, actually works it does it precisely what it's intending to do which is to perpetually dispossess um, and privatize unceded lands to extract value from country through land and water and energy to commodify the practice of dwelling and to coordinate flows of wealth and modes of stigmatization and I think what we need to do is organize and mobilize around Around shifting our discourse around housing so that it doesn't become as we've just been talking um, or doesn't sit only in you know policy fixes but rather a much wider um, understanding of what is actually going on here um, that the crisis is is fundamental and structural to the to the, the system um, it's it's supposed to be like that um, and I think also to um, uh, uh, think about the ways in which there are kind of renewed uh, forms of coordination of power in the hands of private property owners and, and agents um, as a consequence of this. It's something that's really concerning me at the moment, um, the way certain kinds of uh, predatory corporations are, are sort of wheeling around uh, what might be possible out of this. And it, um, I'm a little bit uh, worried about the ways in which um, supposedly socially progressive outcomes are going to be dressed up um, uh, in the face of um, actually what is a, a, a new a new round of predatory wealth speculation and extraction. Thanks. Uh, Libby, thanks very much. I, I'm hearing connections between uh, especially what you said and what uh, Chris was talking about with the kind of re revanchist moment. Um, and also, I, I apologise that your three-minute warning really went to the wrong person. <laughs> so that's my fault. Um, all right, and then Spike is here with me uh, yeah. from the Homeless Persons Union of Victoria. Um, and I'll let Spike take it away. Okay, I just, I'd like to thank Libby for, that was amazing. And I think she really gave us um, a really clear understanding of, of the sort of political landscape in Australia and, and how the market works um, and how the market dominates, uh, uh, how the domin it dominates public space. Recently in, in Australia, in, in Melbourne in 2017, there was a big struggle um, against uh, making it illegal to be asleep on the footpath or in a park. Mm -hmm. And so we had a local mayor here who, who got on side with the local police commissioner who started, um, uh, because of the visible so we have we have a it's called a problem we have people that sleep rough or, or experiencing street homelessness in melbourne and they are the most visible sign of homelessness and so there's approximately um maybe 300 people sleeping rough in the city of melbourne right now and and so the local mayor wanted to make it so we have camping laws in the city that make it illegal for anyone to, to erect a tent or a physical, a physical structure on the footpath or in a park. 
So what they what the, the local government wanted to do was to take out that definition, the definition of, of the the uh, the physical structure, and just leave it anyone asleep anywhere. And so to change the local laws, so that would have enabled them to find people for being asleep, for having their belongings in public, and also to find anyone um, caught assisting anyone who's homeless. So it was a punitive measure, not only to punish the homeless person, but to punish them for being a consumer and having belongings, and to punish anyone who attempted to assist them. Thank goodness that didn't happen because some organisations, some homeless organisations, and some a lot of activists got together and we were able to stop that. Um, what what that what um, brought that that to homelessness to people's attention? was a, a lot of activism on our main, um, like what we have here, Flinders Street, there were a lot of homeless people occupying Flinders Street and they, they'd occupied a piece of town that was near a toilet, near a light, and, and now a large number of people were congregated together. What, what, what that sh what, that was a, that's a big change in Melbourne because homeless people um, in the past were seen to be, uh, you know, the, the the older man with the wino, or um, yeah, sort of people with, with other sort of mental health issues. But what 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 that activism in Flinders showed is that um, it's young people, it's old people, it's people um, from different backgrounds, um, and and they made it clear that they weren't being supported by the existing services. That when, when, when the services and the media tells the, the general public that homeless people are being uh, offered accommodation, what they're being offered is, is rooming houses. We don't have free, we don't have free shelters in, in, in Victoria. I don't know about the rest of the country, we don't have free beds. Anyone that's in emergency accommodation in Australia, pay, in Victoria, pays for that privilege. <laughs> Pays pays up to eighty percent. So people in rooming houses are paying eighty percent of their income in rent, which is most people are on uh, unemployment benefits. So most people on five hundred six were on five hundred five hundred sixty dollars a fortnight, and now are paying um, four hundred four hundred twenty of that. In, so eighty percent of their income. That that's the same for crisis accommodation. P, P, there's no free beds in, in Melbourne. Okay, so just quickly, I, I'd just like to, um, and I, I love that Sarah mentioned um, people with a lived experience being involved in addressing the problems that affect their lives. I think that is in incredibly important. As a peer myself, as someone with a lived experience, and I'm happy to admit, uh, you know, especially for drug users, for street-based drug users, and for homeless people, uh, the, the COVID thing has been an absolute fucking Disaster. Sorry for swearing, but it, it's Sorry. really, it's horrible. It, it's really fucked up for people. Um, initially, in, in early March, they dis, there was these quarantine centres that were going to be built. Um, old, old. Uh, these were house uh, accommodation that was that was and that was being used for um, older older people's homes mm -hmm. that have been uh, commandeered by the state government to, to provide. Uh, um, accommodation for infected homeless people that that, that that's the, that was the idea uh, so what what happened uh, what's happened in Melbourne since the the, ep the pandemic is is that a whole bunch of motels have been identified and, and I heard you guys talking about the idea of motels as a solution to providing support for homeless people during, during this pandemic. And I can tell you that the way that it's been done in Melbourne has been an absolute a fucking nightmare for people because, you know, things change very quickly. Things changed, you know, overnight we had within, uh, sorry, say three or four days, we had Scott Morrison, the prime minister, making an announcement um, on, on the news saying, you know, this is gonna be closed, that's gonna be closed. Um, we're going to start thinking about uh, um, providing an income for the people that lose their jobs. Um, you know, the schools are going to be closed, so parents, blah blah blah. When I got to work, I'm, I'm a house, I'm a homeless outreach worker. When I got to work on the Monday, 
the, the people that, so our service changed overnight. The way we operate as providing showers, food, laundry facilities, a doctor, podiatrist, that changed overnight. So homeless people that had drug problems or needed pharmacotherapy or uh, need to see their mental health worker or to see their lawyer or to see the physio or whatever, that, that changed them overnight. And there was no reassuring message from the prime to people experiencing homelessness or living in rooming houses or, or facing vulnerability. For them, it just happened. Just like everything else that happens to people who are vulnerable, it happens to them, not with them in Melbourne. It, they, the, the, the state government gave $8 million to two organisations in the city, called, one's called Launch, and the other one which you'll be aware of is the Salvation Army was given tax dollars to, to house, to house, uh, to manage human services like accommodation. And so they identified three or four hotels. They didn't, they didn't provide homeless people with any information. They only gave the, the information about the accommodation to outreach teams. So people on the street were finding out about this accommodation through their contact with the outreach workers. They didn't use social media. They didn't, they, there was no posters up on, 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 in services. There was no other attempt to communicate with people having a lived experience, bar through these outreach teams. And so what, what, what happened is that some people uh, were, were getting free accommodation because they're getting through the outreach, through this outreach team. And other people are paying 50% of their income in rent to stay in a motel during a pandemic. I'll, I'll, try, and be, I'll try and finish. But the, the other problem with that is that you, you may have 200 people in a building. There's no, there's no naloxone and there's been overdoses. Um, they, they don't have access to laundry facilities. People that have been able to look after themselves on the street and as... Um, I think it's Jorge Lina from um, Buenos Aires pointed out, people, homeless people or street people do have amazing skills. They do survive uh, in spite of, of all the odds. Um, and I would just, I would guard against using Melbourne model of just throwing people uh, into a motel. And what's happened here is people have just been thrown into motels without support. The workers in there aren't up to, aren't up to the uh, job of providing them support. They, they didn't sign up to be socialists. They don't have stuff not, like naloxone, support workers. Um, yeah, it, it's, 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 been an, it's been an absolute, um, mm. it's been an absolute fucking nightmare for, for, for street people in Melbourne. Yeah. I'm you. sorry, I'll, I'm a bit all over the place. <laughs> yeah. But you've covered a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we've got a couple of minutes for you and Libby to sort okay. of have a bit of a chat. Um, Libby, Libby was amazing. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. I think you both are. Yeah, well, I, I'm not. Yeah, okay. Um, Libby, do you have any uh, responses uh, to Spike? and, and uh, uh, Thanks. Um, that was uh, so helpful, Spike. Thank you for teaching me a bunch of stuff um, and reminding me actually of the rooming house sector and how actually um, specific that is here in uh, forgotten in the and this is why it's so important i think to share experiences across um jurisdictions and nations and whatever um imperial boundaries um so that we can think about that stuff because i had um actually forgotten that yeah you're right we don't do shelters here we do um other forms of awfulness um one thing i wanted to pick up on and maybe this is a um something we can talk about more widely across um everybody that's engaged in this is the really difficult politics um, of having to press on the kind of urgent things around people currently sleeping rough and the you know, allocation of monies and the lack of coordination or communication, all of that really kind of pressing, riding your face stuff. And the, the sort of the longer or um, their long strategies and campaigns too, of course, but the, the, the kind of structural stuff around how do we advocate for you know, more public housing, how do we reorganise housing systems in fairer ways? What, what are, and I find some of the, um, I find it really challenging myself in my own um, 
sort of advocacy work to try and work across um, all of those spheres. And I wondered, Spike, if you had any insights for me um, on how to do that better. Um, I think I sometimes... Advocate for public housing. Well, just to coordinate across, you know, they're, they're all linked together. You know, advocating yeah. for more public housing is, is intrinsically linked to, you know, the decriminalisation of homelessness and the, the rough sleeping and the, the actual on the ground kind of dealing with it. And, and yet I think we don't often make those links as strongly as we might. Um, and, I, you know, maybe there's a, a thing there that we could work on more. I totally agree. I think I think that that might be one. If there's any silver lining in this whole in this whole fucking nightmare, that one of it might be that we do develop a relationship, because I have heard it discussed, you know, amongst policy. Like my boss, for example, he, he's, you know, they they're usually so fucking conservative and anti public housing. And as you pointed out, there's a huge stigma attached to being a public housing tenant. But, you know, and we also have the right-wing media in this country that's been incredibly effective in, in stereotyping homeless people and make that, which, that make uh, um, an effective public housing campaign very difficult with the Murdoch press, especially. They, they make it, it they, it's like a vendetta against any sort of public structures, any sort of level. It's like they, they're uh, averse to any sort of transparency, any type of democracy, any type of accountability. Any, any time that we attempt to work, people, it's, it's people are worried about how they're going to be portrayed in the media and, and the right-wing press. And, and I think this, this might be a, real, a really important time to develop. Maybe we should get in touch with it. Definitely. <laughs> I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe that's also, a, Libby's question is also a good question for all of us here. Um, so I, I, we're, we're taking questions by the Facebook, uh, Verso Facebook page and Verso YouTube page. Uh, and no one's posted any questions so far, but I do know that we have uh, 30 people watching on Facebook and 89 on YouTube. Well, that was as of a few moments ago. So there's uh, about 120 of you out there watching and listening. Please feel free to, to send us questions. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I wonder if I could ask everybody to take them, their mics off mute. Uh, and I wonder if I could uh, direct Libby's question to all of us. Um, and, and the, you know, the question is how do, we, um, how do we see all of these struggles resonating with each other and how would we work across, um, how would we work across sectors? Or do you see ways in which you're, the, the organizing you're doing links up with the organising that uh, some of the rest of us are doing. Do you want to... oh, go for it if you... Um, oh, I, I, I don't have an answer for that right now. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think this is all under the... I mean, looking at this holistically, and it needs to be looked at holistically, it, it's, about, it's about human rights. Um, it's about... Um, yeah, it's about being being uh, being able to access public space. Um, yeah, it's about it's about respecting our, um, human rights and 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 that and housing, homelessness, access to sorry, housing, access to health services. You know, being able to express yourself. These are all things that are really important, and being able to contribute to the public discourse is also important. And that's another and and so, and I suppose. For me, the biggest challenge is how do we get, as something I mentioned earlier, how, and, and Sarah did, is how with people with the lived experience, and I've been working with some rough sleepers over the last 18 months, and it is possible, you know, they have amazing skills, talents, abilities as how, how do we get their voices to become more prominent? Because it seems to be, it seems to me like that sort of testimonial is, people's lived experience is very powerful. And I think if, if the, the marketing people can teach us anything is, is that, you know, testimonials are things like, no, I can't believe it's not butter. That's fantastic. You know, sort of like, you know, this is what's happened to me. Mm -hmm. This is how this has affected me. I remember the union ads were really effective during, around the election campaign. I think if we can come together and, and um, support the voices that aren't being heard, I think that's one, that's one way forward. Mm -hmm. um. Do, uh, do any of the rest of you want to respond? Um, it seems like the 
one of the things that has come out of all of this. Oh, wait, I heard someone. No, I, I, I was thinking um, that this uh, difficulties to connect the other struggles that maybe is something I tried to say at, at the end of my uh, intervention. talk, intervention, thanks Monica, about the feminists and how this movement, at least in Argentina and also in Latin America and internationally, you know, try to transverse struggles. And I think we need to learn more about the ways in which this movement um, create, creatively, artistically, you know, they have different ways to, to struggle, to show, to discuss, to report, to, to show the, the problems. And I think this is one, of, one thing. And the other one, I think, I, I don't have an answer, but maybe some things I was thinking related with the ideas people in general ha have related to homeless people. I mean, uh, <clears throat> social representations about the homelessness, focus on deficit and the lack of things. So I think these social and uh, historical and cultural ideas of homelessness, um, people tend to look them as the lack of everything. So I think this is a obstacle or something that we need to to, to work on, you know, because not only the general people think, you no, know, in neighborhoods and people that so, so, so see homeless people in everyday life, also the services and sometimes the uh, movements, you no know, political movements, yeah. think in homelessness as they are less than the other ones. So we need to show them how to do things, how to think, and so that's one of the reasons I think we need to learn more about those uh, movements that bottom up, you know, trying to include, even with the, the difference and the, the contrast and the tensions, sometimes we have in the ways we think with homeless people and others who are not homeless or those who hasn't or haven't the life experience of being homeless. I don't know. I don't know if I make clear. I was thinking um while it was listening hmm. i especially appreciate the point that uh homelessness is a feminist issue and along with that homelessness is an anti-racist issue homelessness is a decolonizing issue and i think link no making it an explicit point of linking those struggles you know mm -hmm. how do we end homelessness uh as tina tina mentioned we also need to have a, a you know, feminist disaster recovery plan, and that, yeah, and it's all and it's also about accepting that for some people mm -hmm. that they they you know for some people living in four walls um, and and having a fridge and a freezer it's not for them, and and it's mm -hmm. about it's about educating the community that for some folks who have experienced trauma who have been um, uh, you know for for whatever reason don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable. Um, you know, not it's middle class suburbia isn't for everyone. Or you know, yeah. there's some folks that you know. We we there was a study done in Australia in Victoria that journeys to social inclusion. They found that they they they, they provided. Um, so the housing first model was used. So people were housed first before they dealt with their whatever issues there was. So whatever they might have gambling, drug issues, whatever. They were housed first, and then the wraparound supports were, were provided. 70% of those people um, um, went on and were, were, in their terms, successfully housed. So it shows that if, and they save money on emergency hospital, emergency beds, prison, um, uh, police, all that sort of, the, the government saved money. So rather than using that, that, that evidence as a way to, to provide, to actually properly fund the house model, they've gone the other way. They've gone the other way and, 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 and what, they have, what we have in Melbourne is more of like a, a homelessness, like a triage, where if you're sick, you go in, you get, you get bandaged up and you're thrown back out onto the street. For, for, so I suppose the point I'm making is the, the government, the people that have the resources know what works um, people need people don't don't just need a roof. They all 
it's the community. And if your community's on the street, you're going to walk out of it. You're going to walk out of your house. That, that's, that's what the journey to social inclusion found, that if you can't, if people weren't able to develop communities where they lived, it never succeeded. Mm. And so for many people, sleeping rough is, in, and, and it's about accepting that as an option for some folks, I think. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think, yeah. I, on that point, I would love to point people's, um, I guess, attention to um, Hawaii's history of these encampments becoming pu'uhonua or sanctuaries. Um, so they're, you know, um, people living in them don't feel homeless because that is home. And and also the relationships within those communities become sanctuary and refuge to the extent that like that's a much greater support than four walls sometimes. Um, I think that's really important. Also on Libby's point, I wanted to um, <laughs> talk a little bit about the, um, I guess, yeah, that thinking through the connections between like tenant organizing or public housing organizing and um, organizing around houselessness. Um, I, we recently put out an op-ed talking about um, the need for protections for tenants um, for like canceling rent and a rent moratorium. And the comments were so angry and hateful. Um, and it reminded me so much of the kinds of uh, comments that people make about the houseless. Um, and I feel like this partially relates to the ways that we value the way we value people in our society is so tied to our ability to possess property. But then also I think too that um, it has to do with this broader precarity where, especially in the US and Hawaii, housing as an asset is the only kind of source of financial security for retirement, for example. So people get super defensive and incredibly um, angry when, when they feel like someone is trying to step on, you know, the, what they've worked so hard to earn. But um, yeah, I also, I think that the pandemic is kind of making those connections clearer where because so many people are experiencing increased housing insecurity um, and uncertainty that maybe it now is a time to kind of bridge those connections a little bit more. And just quickly, the, the question that we had from the, um... Uh, from the web from one of our listeners was on very much along those lines about how we see uh, achieving housing inequality within the specific political systems. Uh, they were asking about the United States, but this is just as true in, in Melbourne, uh, and I assume it's also true in, in Buenos Aires, exactly as you say, within the, the, the particular political system we have, uh, de facto citizenship is still attached to uh, shelter and, and prop property ownership in many ways. Uh, Monica, I know you were about to respond and then to Yeah, Monica. I, um, so I'm inspired by all of you guys. Thank you so much for all your interventions. And I, and I think that um, part of the answer to me is to think about um, how we connect the different struggles for housing. So no, no, just homelessness, but also renters and people living in precarious uh, settlements and slums. So if you think about it, like the majority of the people in, in at least in Buenos Aires, live in some sort of precarious situation, more or less. I like, like I pay rent, and if I don't get a paycheck, I you know I cannot afford renting my apartment. So um, so to me is it comes down to a question that we've been discussing in Buenos Aires uh, through several collectives that uh, some of them been working for for years now, which is. The, the right to house is very much connected with the right to land, which goes back to what Livy was talking about before, right? Like if we go back to, you know, how the first uh, inhabitants of these lands also were dispossessed of their land. And ultimately it's like, who has the right to own land? And, and, and the, the house where you, like the land where you build a house, it should be at least secure. It shouldn't be something like it's possessed by anyone, right? And, um, um, and one of the things that's been going on here a lot is um, a, a discussion and, and some actual projects have been taking place about how um, cooperatives building houses and, and then these houses are not possessed by anyone. They go back to the cooperative once the person who live in the house um, 
dies or, or leaves the city. So it's a way of securing housing for everyone and not treating housing as a commodified uh, thing, right? And so I think it's, it's a question of, we should be asking, yeah, the questions about land more often. Um, Chris, did you want to respond as well? Yeah, to pick up on what Monica just said, just two days ago, the California State Assembly issued uh, an amendment to the Constitution for a right to housing. Now, even though this is unlikely to pass this round, this is the first time such an idea and has been formally put forward, and I think it's attached um, to you know this very moment. And I think what this moment also reveals of this need for decommodified housing is also what we're seeing is an opening in the public perception of using uh, public use for property right now. And um, so this goes to the hotels, the idea that we can lease them or even commandeer them to use for a public health issue, but also what we're seeing in public space, that this should be open. And it's gonna be hard to work back because we're exposing how the criminalization in normal times is detrimental to public health. Finally, we have public health folks who are getting on the TV getting in the newspapers and are talking about what we have always called is the slow death that it happens when homelessness when you're out on the streets for a long time. Or in the US, what we also relate to black death, because in the US, 40% of our uh, homeless population is black, although only 20% is poor, and only 13% total population is African American. So. Um, these the ideas are finally rising to the surface and I think are setting a new stage of how we're thinking about this. The second aspect is what um, Libby spoke to very well and we also hear in Argentina, which is that the commodification and financialization of housing has risen to such an extent that more people than ever are precariously housed, paying more than 30%, many people paying more than 50% of their income on rent. And this is not panning out well when we are shutting down the economy. At the same time, as um, I think um, a number of folks, I forget if it was Monica or, uh, or Alina, who spoke to the fact that money is not getting to those who don't have jobs. Like the old way we would solve this. They're giving me based on furlough, who are not tied to that worker con work contract. Um, is my video breaking up? Just a little bit. Okay, I'm going to stop it. But it, as we've had a break in the contract between work and social reproduction, um, we have to find new means of, <laughs> of surviving. And what was very interesting was that the main actions going on in May Day in San Francisco were not employer-based <laughs> workers' rights, but were rent cancellation strikes um, because it was the day we had to pay rent and no one had been working for the month. And I think that depending on how this plays out, um, I think the struggles around housing and property are rising in prominence over that of the workplace. And depending on how we come out of this and what politics are in place in our various countries, I think it's going to be a huge difference. Someone specifically asked about the U.S. of if Biden is able to win the election and we have some of the ideas of Sanders and Warren coming in on a wealth tax and uh, producing housing, as Spike said, in terms of investing in public housing uh, to get the jobs back will be a very different response and, and, and is possibly called for because unlike other disasters too, this is national. It's not just in a specific locale. And we're seeing the need for a total public response. Um, there are, I mean, it, it, the nature of this, of just being needing a national, like full on total public federal response is very unique in a way that a lot of the uh, initial insertions of privatization, which are there definitely in the medical and we're seeing in the tech with, you know, new technologies coming in, it, it, it's less so than other disasters. And I think that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we're, we've got a few more questions coming in. Uh, I'm not sure how long everybody can stick around. We've gone a little bit longer than we planned, but it's the internet, so there's no uh, <laughs> there's, there, there's no time limit. I, I know other people might need to go uh, to, and do other things, but we did get a few more questions come in, and I think we've already started to answer. Uh, one question was, what are the deep social structures that brought about homelessness? Um, and along with that, they were asking, is this a peculiar problem of urban centres? Um, so, uh, and we've started to get into that. And then as another person asked, what is the effective action we need to take to end homelessness and create affordable housing? 
So I think we've started to delve into those. Uh, I'm not sure if you all had any uh, anything you wanted to add about those two, two questions, deep structure and, and specific actions for affordable housing. Maybe I'll, can I jump in? Um, uh, those are great questions, all of them. Um, I, I, just on the uh, urban centres um, one, certainly here in Australia, it's not merely a question, just certainly not for the metropolitan areas. I mean, it's intense in the metropolitan areas, but um, it's widespread in smaller communities all around the country um, and in sort of regional centres as well. Um, and I think that often gets forgotten. Uh, I know I on myself, I think I have a very urban focus and I sometimes forget that this is a, a, a kind of wider problem. Um, so obviously there's, uh, and it leads I think to that question around the what's the underlying set of structures that produce this problem, which is I think where we always kind of need to come back to and look um, while we're also trying to manage um, the responses to the, to the more immediate um, in your face kind of crises uh, is to come back and look at how that gets produced and it's surely around all the things we've we've been discussing um, around the commodification of housing as a product rather than um, at the, the fundamental right to dwell, um, to dwell safely on terms of your own uh, choosing on conditions of your own choosing exactly as, as Spike and Tina have spoken so well about that that might not be four walls and a roof it might look different um, and the the lack of um, respect and um, humanity afforded to people who choose differently or um, who seek different uh, kinds of alternatives um, I, it needs to be part of this conversation that so much I think is certainly in Australia of um, the sort of solutions question to um, housing crisis uh, is all about you know financial models of building housing um, and, and those are really important of course um, but I, I think we're so locked into a very narrow view of what it looks like to um, dwell in fair and sustainable ways uh, and if we could crack that open um, in this moment and really start looking um, at other alternatives I reckon that would be a wonderful thing. It's, it's interesting it's like in, in all the countries like Argentina, Australia, the United States we think we're open communities we have you know the pluralism and, and all these competing ideas Obviously, as Libby's pointed out there's, there's one way of doing things and any other way is seen, you're, you're seen to be sort of like, you know, are you a communist or something, some sort of crazy, it's, it's, but, and it's just that lack of, the lack of, of options for people, the lack of acceptable options mm -hmm. and, 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 and the lack of voices as well. And so those voices, the voices that they tend to be the voices that want to support the way things are which is incredibly depressing and that's not an answer it's just an observation that yet yeah, in supposedly mm. open communities is a very narrow band of ideas mm. one of the things i really appreciated that monica said was that this is a moment when we can find the cracks in that system to to squeeze them open and i feel like in every context that we've heard about we've also heard about those cracks and, and that moment to whether it's hotel rooms um or whether it's encampments, uh, that, that there are moments for us to re to reach in and uh, and and work within the work within the contradictions of the system. So, so um, for, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, thanks. Um, I I'm thinking about the second question and um, reminded of something that Raquel Rolnick said, um, who is the former UN rapporteur on the right to adequate housing. But she said um, that we should strike the term affordable housing from our vocabulary because it's bullshit. <laughs> Those are her words. And we should be using the term, we should be talking about public housing, social housing. And I feel like that's something I've been trying to do in my work and in just my daily conversations with people because that term affordable housing has been completely co-opted and appropriated by developers um it literally means nothing and in fact it means market rate housing um <laughs> so yeah mm. um we've had one more question uh which was how do we win that ground in terms of the propaganda war and right-wing media 
And we've heard just a little bit about that, especially from Spike, um, because it gets, gets really bad in Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, but it's also, it's a common thread across all of the places where, where all of us work. Uh, you know, the public messaging around homelessness as a, um, uh, as a problem, you know, in the United States, they've gone so far as to propose forced or, uh, or coercive relocation camps. That's part of the public discourse now, you know, from, from the White House down to local media, uh, which is another phrase, uh, another name for concentration camps, and that's actually proposed. So how do we win back ground there? Do any of you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, David, you might be referring to when it was in the news a bit in September when um, Trump uh, was uh, announcing his plan to clean up homelessness and across California and named a homeless czar who was proposing these sorts of camps and visiting LA. And one interesting thing there that I noticed was a realignment in the politics, actually, because up until that moment, um, Governor Newsom, Kamala Harris, these people we think of, you know, liberal progressives, were some of the biggest anti-homeless le leaders in pushing anti-homeless laws. When Governor Newsom was mayor of San Francisco, he pushed the sit-lie law that Spike was talking about earlier so hard that even when the Board of Supervisors said, no, we're not going to pass this, he said, yes, we are, and he took it to the ballot. He was pushing the same sorts of policies as Trump, and it was a bipartisan issue, very much like mass incarceration had always been. And even though we'd seen sort of a rollback on the decarceration, the punitive approach to homelessness was still strong. And so Trump actually brought out a contrast that now uh, is opening up space. And it's also aligning uh, some of these uh, discursive things with, uh, you know, relating to immigration and that discourse and the, these ideas of sanctuary. And so it's actually building bridges across there. So, um, I mean, that is one, um, you know, a way that, I, you know, we can hope that maybe we can, um, you know, uh, build some bridges and fight back this, but it is, it's a polarized propaganda. I don't see how you're convincing the other side. It's more of how you're playing off of them, but curious what mm -hmm. it looks like in say Argentina or Australia in different political contexts. Uh, I wonder, uh, so I know that uh, at least one of us has to run and I'd love to get everybody to sort of uh, say, a, uh, give a closing thought before we run. So I wonder if we can uh, call it to a close there uh, and just ask everybody if you've got a, a closing thought to share. Um, and who... Whoever it feels well, like to begin. He's mine. <laughs> <laughs> We've just got to keep up the struggle, right? Like, I, I, I don't think there's any other answer than that, that the, the, there's always going to be struggle um, and w just not to lose heart um, in the face of it and to keep finding each other. That, that's the only way. Whenever I get, you know, down and depressed by the shitstorm, um, the various shitstorms, I just go, well, just let's organize. Let's just keep mobilizing. Let's just keep at it. Um, mm -hmm. That's my only answer. <laughs> it's pretty thin, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, in Spanish, we say ocupar la calle. That's mean occupy the streets, the street. you know? Mm -hmm. Go out. And I think this is like homeless people. Stay with them in the public spaces. We need to show also to stay there, to struggle, to go out. And I think something is important to say that sometimes these discussions about the demonstrations and how to struggle and the partner, I think we need to, to deep more in the relationship with this progressive government and the mm -hmm. social movements because sometimes there are some tensions that make for us difficult the, this kind of reporting or a struggle. I mean that we need to, I mean that is, that is something in Latin America that we need to deep more. Uh, specifically because of those kind of progressive uh, government specifically we have now in Argentina and I think it's we need to to learn a little more. Yeah and going back to your question Chris um, I think it's in Argentina it's not so much the case that we have like the kind of hate speech that you've seen so much spread in the US and other places but it's 
basically the complete invisibility of homeless people. So the, what, what we were telling before about the policy being how the COVID crisis is addressed and does not contemplate at all the bodies and the souls on the minds of the homeless. So I think it's working on that, working on like making them visible, making us in relation to them visible. Um, and I and I think that's 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 what I would say that it's the case in, 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 in Argentina at least, yeah. Um, Chris, I yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it back to two points of uh, what the, the specific moment we're in right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the first really gets to this point of which the entire relational poverty network is all about, which is how it is the wealthy and those who oppress are tied to the poor and the oppressed. And so COVID-19 is really interesting. And people ask me, like, why do you think that you're having these cracks open up so you can do this work in San Francisco. Whereas like when I was working in New Orleans and Katrina, it just seemed impossible. Every time we looked for something, it was like privatization, disaster capitalism, interest there. And you know, my theory is that there's this class politics behind it that COVID is one that it's going to infect, we know the poor and those unhoused the most, but the infection can spread across class lines. And so, I mean, in a city like San Francisco that is so dense and polarized between the very wealthy and the very poor, I sadly do not believe much that it's out of this, unfortunately, empathy and care of poor people's health. It's out of the fear that, there, that other wealthier folks will catch it. And secondly, economics. We cannot reopen until we reach certain thresholds in these liberal places that are actually following the scientists. So, you know, every day that this is staying uh, in uh, as the reservoir of poverty, this is going to be another day we're not reopening. And how do we reopen? And so I'm very scared for two possibilities. One is that you, you lead more towards ghettoization and quarantining and you take this population outside of the broader social body. Or we really do this push to get everyone housed so we don't have this public health issue again. And my last thing I'll say is that many people are predicting a even harsher second wave. And this is a very unique instance for us who are organizers or scholars studying disasters because usually don't, we don't get to study it back to back and correct our mistakes. And as much as I hope it doesn't happen, if November we're facing a bigger second wave and a bigger lockdown, we should be using all this time in between to really think about how we're gonna approach this next peak differently and politicize, expose, and work around it to make a difference. Um, Tana, do you have a yeah. <laughs> um, mm, I think one thing I've been holding really close to me throughout the pandemic is that quote from Arundhati Roy that um, the pandemic is a portal. And I've been thinking so much about how it's actually a multitude of portals, uh, so many, sometimes like a glimpse into a really scary scary world and then sometimes like right next to it or even in the same moment a glimpse at something brighter and a little bit better so today I feel like I got I got so many portals opened up to me and I just want to say thanks to everyone for sharing and um yeah I don't know helping me to kind of imagine something different and learn from the work that you folks are doing thanks. that sounds like a really perfect place to to bring it to a close, uh, you know, from, yep, I think me and, me and Spike are pretty moved by that. Uh, and grateful to uh, everybody who's been listening. Um, and uh, if you're listening, uh, we'll be doing three more of these uh, every week at the same time. Um, again, uh, this one's been on shelter and, and the city. The next one is on the work of care, the labour of social reproduction and how that's become visible uh, and vulnerable at the same time. The one after that is about the way in which the economic social contract itself has been renegotiated and new safety nets created. Um, and then the last one will be about borders and mobility. Uh, so please do check back with Verso uh, and or you can follow me on Facebook. Um, I'll be publicising it or uh, sorry Twitter. I'll be publicising it there too. Um, and Goodness, thank you. At moments like this, and I know, and I want to say that um, 
you know, it, it's you can't see it here, but everybody here uh, who's joined us uh, is struggling in in our various ways. Um, you know, some of us have lost people we care about to the pandemic. Um, some of us are taking care of people who are homeless right now because of the pandemic. Uh, we're all overworked. We're all facing the threat of losing our jobs or whatever. So I want to say thank you profoundly to everybody who's here and this ability to bring people together uh, is one of the things that uh, that uh, I'm sick of the metaphor silver lining so I'm not going to use it but it's one of the th <laughs> one of the things that gives me hope in these moments um, and makes organizing feel possible so I want to close with gratitude um, and I'll see uh, see you all next week same time same place thank you all thanks Amy. Bye. take care